Christian greetings, everyone out there in Facebook, social media, TV land. <laughs> um, want to bring you a short little, well, ain't nothing about our God little, so a short big word. From the Lord. I'm trying to get my camera situated here. So a little bit more. There we go. Kind of put it up. Uh, we'll be bringing a short, important message. Of course, any message from God's important. Book any. Uh, from the book of Acts, chapter 19. Uh, and I want to deal with the topic, the subject of. Um, haunted houses and uh, also with the subject of demon possession and uh, when you study the ministry not only of Jesus Christ but if you look closely uh, at the book of Acts and the early church and the signs and wonders that accompanied the apostles and those who preached the gospel uh, Everywhere you see, you you see healings, physical. Um, of course, most importantly, you see people coming to faith in Jesus Christ. But you also see the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire with the initial evidence of speaking with other tongues of the Spirit of God gives utterance as recorded in Acts 2 verses 4. And along with that, the Holy Spirit possessing believers you also find those who are possessed with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Holy One, casting the evil one, casting demons out of those who are possessed with unclean spirits, with foul spirits, with demon spirits. Even in Mark's writing, 16 verses 18, he said, if you believe these signs are gonna follow, in my name you'll cast out devils, you'll speak with new tongues. The word new there in Greek literally means fresh, new, fresh, fresh, new would mean unknown, unheard of, a language not known. So this is in reference to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And it's amazing that the sign that Jesus said would follow his believers, they would cast out demons, would evict demons. That means literally out of people who are under demonic control. Uh, he says there's a close connection to this sign, casting out devils, to being possessed, baptized with the Holy Ghost, speaking, praying with other tongues. So the two go together and the modern church should be exhibiting both. If the church modernly is spirit filled, there should be this common, but holy, common manifestation of casting out demon spirits out of people and so and and also out of places because we're going to talk about people demon possessed for a moment in particular places and where demon possession uh you know people and places you know even is recorded in the bible and uh so we're going to be discussing just for a brief moment about haunted houses also the bible said in first thessalonians 5 22 abstain from every appearance of evil uh so it don't take a unique special discernment here when it concerns abstaining from that that's evil. God just said simply, if it has the appearance of that that's evil, abstain. Abstain's just a word that means stay away from that. You don't go there. If it appears, if the appearance is evil. And when it comes to Halloween that I often refer to as Halloween, and the 30th of October, Sunday morning, 11 a.m., right here at Acts 29 Church in the God at 2913 Albany Avenue in Waycross, Georgia, we'll be dealing in depth as we expose Halloween and show you. I said Halloween. That's right, because that's where its roots is. That's where it's come from. And uh, we'll show you even, even the modern customs that are connected to the ancient customs rooted in paganism and, uh, and show you by God's word what he does decides and defines what's acceptable and not what's not acceptable 
and uh, we'll also give you a historical background, but a biblical overview of how God sees things. So who cares what the world sees and what their opinion is or what even some of the church may say, what does God think about something? And that's the business we're in. And uh, it's not opinions, but the truth. And so, but 1 Thessalonians 5, 22 said, abstain, stay away, avoid, you know, the appearance of evil. So if it appears to be evil, don't take no special, you know, gift of discernment to understand, you know, that's evil. And friend, the modern Halloween, you can, you can mask it with fun, fantasy, um, haunted houses. You know, people have this fascination with fear slash fun and fear is fun. It gives them an adrenaline, a, a little thrill and, and it's just only make believe, but the monsters and the demons and the witches and the death and the blood and the gory that's connected and associating with the so-called fun, feared places, fueled with fear, fun, uh, uh, just child's play, some would say, and it's just make-believe. It's just a movie on a silver screen. It's just a place just one time out of the year where we walk through and for fun, we get scared. And uh, all this stuff is not really a reality. And that is the culture we live in, sadly, within the church culture, that we get so far away from Christ and his truth that things that are associated with evil that even have the appearance on the surface, it's not hidden, that it's evil, that it's, you take a D off a, you know, devil and you got evil. So put a D in front of evil, you got devil. And it's almost like, uh, you know, there's been a redefining of what's of the devil, what is evil and what is not. And uh, you can call demons by another name, they're still demons. You can Christianize it but it's still demonic. And so the root of it is, in, is, is evil spirits that are involved and engaged in this. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love and of a sound mind, 2 Timothy 1, 7. So this fear is an ungodly fear. God said, I didn't give it. So there's only one other candidate that gives this type of fear, even if people associate it with fun, quote unquote. It's straight from hell, straight from, you know, Satan himself. So, uh, you know, these, these, these haunted houses people attend, it is, it's obvious the word haunted. It's obvious the imagery and the appearances, it is evil. And first Thessalonians 5, 22 says abstain from it. Now, who is the writer of first Thessalonians 5, 22? Who is he writing this to? He's writing this to God's people. In other words, this is not a message to the world. The world's going to be the world. The world's going to go do what the world does. The world's entertained by the world. The world is a friend of the world. But James 4 and 4, God says, if you're a friend of this world, you're an enemy of God. And, uh, you know, friendship to this world is enmity against God. That word enmity goes all the way back to in the book of Genesis, Genesis 3, 15, where God prophesied. He said, I'm going to put enmity. This means a hatred between the woman's seed. That's the virgin. That's Mary, her seed. A woman can't have a seed. So it's the seed of God that was conceived by the Holy Ghost in that virgin womb, Matthew 1, 20 which is none other than Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That is the seed of the woman. And between the seed of that serpent, the serpent's going to bruise his heel. But my seed, the seed of the woman, the virgin-born one, the virgin-born seed, the Messiah, Jesus, he's going to crush the serpent's head. That's Genesis 3.15. So from the beginning in Genesis, there's been an enmity, a, a divine hatred, so to speak, between light and dark, between the Savior and the serpent. They will never come together. They will never agree. There'll never be unity between our Savior and the serpent, and never will there be unity among the spirit-filled, spirit-led saint and the spirits of the serpent that are wicked and evil and associated with the appearance and the imagery of anything evil. And so the word haunted, I want you, I want you to hear this for a minute, the word haunted houses Literally, you can find this most likely even in your Webster's Dictionary. I've been preaching on this stuff going on 32 years, so I'm no novice at this. Uh, so if you're looking for an argument, you don't want to come with that. I promise you, you just don't want to go there. I've, I've, had, I've had people in, in, in colleges and universities social media, on social media platforms years ago try to argue this point with me, and they teach classes and get paid, and they got... 
PhDs and whatever else in front of their name, and eventually they just shut up, they quit. And I'm not saying that arrogantly. I'm just telling you, I'm no novice at what I'm talking about. I, I've searched, I've sought God. I've, I like I say, I've been doing this almost 32 years, and I'm not compromising on it even in the hour we live. Many are. I've had pastors approach me after they've heard these things I would preach, and they said, Brother Marvin, I've studied like you have. I know what you're saying is the truth, not only biblically, but historically. And But if I preach that in our pulpit, they will kick me out of the church. And, so, and then I've had one pastor say years ago, what should I do? I say, preach and get kicked out of the church. What else is there to do? <laughs> I mean, if you called to preach, you know, if you called by God to preach, you'll preach not as pleasing men, but pleasing God, which tries the heart. First Thessalonians 2, 4. So we've had different experiences like that. And, and, and so the word haunted here, haunted houses, literally means unholy houses. Why are they unholy? Because the haunting that goes on in these houses is not Holy Spirit, but it's evil spirits. So at the very root of the definition of haunted, that word haunted means it's unholy. That means it is unholy spirits that are involved and engaged. And the root of it is in that that is unholy, that that is evil, evil spirits, the devil himself. So the very practical definition of Haunted literally means unholy houses. So when you hear haunted houses, I want you to think evil spirits. I want you to think demons, devils, the devil himself, unholy, which is the very exact opposite, like night and day, because God divides light and darkness, Genesis 1-4, because he is like Satan is the prince of darkness. It's a divide always, always. I call it the divine divide. It, it's very divided. It, it'll stay divided. They're, they're never come together. There'll never be an agreement. And so uh, the Holy Spirit is holy. Satan is unholy. So whatever is unholy is of him, the devil, the fallen, the fallen angel. And that that is holy is of the Holy Spirit. And so the word, the very definition expresses haunted house. Haunted houses means unholy houses. So any place that's advertising, come. Walk through the cornfields, our haunted cornfields. Walk through our haunted houses, our haunted parlors and our whatever. And they got haunted in front of it. And they got, you know, uh, gory death advertisements, you know, imagery. Of that is wicked and death and, 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 and murder and, and, uh, and these different things and, and ghosts and, and uh, monsters. All this stuff is rooted in Satan. That's where it comes from. There's, there's no compromise in that. So the Holy Spirit and haunted or unholy houses, no matter if it's, you know, dressed up, you know, with fun and fantasy, the fear, it still comes from him, the devil. All right. The, the, also, haunted houses are called horror houses, uh, defined as a place. This is what horror house means. This is in your dictionary. A place frequented by a ghost of the deceased, possessed by an evil spirit. Other words associated with it is fear, hell, darkness, evil, demons, Satan, witches, torment, anguish, death, murder, cursed or curses, jinxed or jinxes, eerie, spooky. So that all comes up under the heading of the definition of a haunted house, an unholy house, which is the opposite of holy ghost. So the ghosts that are portrayed in this haunted house are evil ghosts. They're they're the portraying uh, the, so to speak, uh, imaginary manifestation of what is real. And now it's just been said to be fun and fantasy laced with fear and uh, child's play that it's not really real, uh, but it is real. The spirits behind it and that are producing this are very, very real. They're not make-believe. Uh, so... The horror houses, the haunted houses, the unholy houses, 
Amen. This is a place that, that is defined, even in the dictionary, as frequented. That means often uh, visited and, and even possessed with a ghost, not a holy ghost, remember, because this is unholy, evil ghost uh, that is possessed. It even involves the definition, the word haunted, unholy houses, amen, horror house. One of the definitions is a house that is possessed with demons. How can somebody who is a believer in Jesus Christ has been washed in his shed blood, who is possessed or filled with his ghost that is holy, have any associating, have any association with the appearance of this that is so wicked and evil, that, that glorifies the glory and the death, murder, eerie, jinxes, curses, demons, Satan, and witches, uh, and, and, and the imagery that goes along with all this. I'll tell you, they can't. Yeah, if the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, he does not enjoy these things. No, he does not. He don't encourage others to be entertained by those things. Those things do not entertain them. Why? Because the Holy Ghost in you is holy. He's not entertained by that that's unholy. So what this simply means is Ephesians 4.30 says, grieve not the Holy Ghost whereby you're sealed into the day of redemption. If the Holy Ghost truly has a heart and that heart is totally 100% surrendered to him as the spirit of the Lord, they will not have this appetite, uh, this, so to speak, adrenaline thrill to be associated with these things that involve haunted houses that are nothing more than a display of that that is demonic. They don't enjoy it. That it's not something they desire. The Holy Ghost would grieve so deeply in you if he really rules and reigns in your heart. You could not enjoy it. Uh, you couldn't have anything to do with it. I promise you. The Holy Ghost is Holy Ghost. In him an evil ghost, that that is dark, they do not get along. The Holy Ghost would grieve in you. And if you're not grieving and you're actually enjoying these things, this causes me to question, have you really surrendered all to this Lord Jesus Christ that you confess with your mouth? Because the Holy Spirit in you would grieve. You couldn't, you couldn't be associated with those things. All right. And so this is where we're at in the modern lukewarm church, amen, where um, anything's accepted anymore. Why? Because it's not really real. And so that's what they think. Uh, the definition itself of haunted house should be proof enough to the church today that these make-believe horror houses are an imitation of the appearance of real evil demon possession. That's right. I call them demon-possessed houses because the very definition, part of the definition, within the definition of haunted or unholy houses means a place that's frequented by demons that is possessed with evil spirits. So that's what the whole thing is. That's why it's called haunted, because it's an advertisement of a house that's possessed with demons and devils, all right? And so though the images and the characters in these houses, these haunted houses of fear are portrayed, you know, by literal actors in the flesh, yet in the spirit there is always the presence of evil spirits, from which all this glorification of fear and death is associated. And Ephesians 5.11 says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So if you're really a true believer in Christ, you don't approve of these, you reprove these. The Holy Ghost in me can't help but reprove it, not approve it. And for me as a man of God, a preacher of this gospel of Jesus Christ, full of his Holy Ghost, been doing this almost 32 years. For me not to reprove it in my silence is the same of approving it. So preacher, if you, if, you, if you don't get you some Holy Ghost backbone and preach against this stuff and stop fearing the people, uh, God says to stay silent on these subjects and these things and to allow this you know, to be in the church and among the people that you're shepherding is to approve of it in silence. Uh, so, and it's to have fellowship with it. Well, Brother Marvin, we don't do it, but we don't say nothing about it. 
Well, that's the same right here in Ephesians 5, 11 of having fellowship with it. He said, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. He said, rather reprove them. So guess what? If you're not reproving it, if you're not calling it out, you're in fellowship with it. To not say anything about it when you see the wrong is to fellowship with it. That is to agree with it, to approve of it if you don't reprove it. And, and I'm just telling you what the word of God says. In Acts chapter 19, verses 11, God wrought special, unique, unusual miracles through the hands of Paul the apostle. They took from his body in verses 12, and, you know, to the sick, handkerchiefs and aprons that he wore on his body, his clothing while he was preaching. And it says diseases departed from the people. And it said evil spirits, demons went out of them. So these were part of the special miracles in Acts chapter 19 that, that was being exhibited through Paul's ministry. You know, and I know it's strange, but we need some more strange again. God chooses the foolishness of preaching to save them that will believe, 1 Corinthians 1, 21. And he's chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, verse 27. So this was strange. That's what special would translate as uh, here in Acts 19, verses 11. Strange miracles. You know, God was taking garments uh, or pieces of clothing from his garments, handkerchiefs and aprons, and people were giving those things and they were being healed. Diseases departed and demons departed. Demons were cast out. And that's why the church modern in the day still does that. We still do that. Still believe that. I mean, a woman touched Jesus' his garment and virtue flowed out. Luke 8, and she was healed. You know, Peter even walked by in Acts 5 and they laid the sick where every shadow might be cast and God healed them. You know, so these, these are strange miracles. Why? Because the Holy Ghost is the one performing them, the Spirit of God. And, 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 and during this time in Acts 19, 11, and 12, it starts off in verse 13 and said there were certain vagabond uh, Jews who were exorcists. So these people were Jews. They, they were magicians, really. They were witches posing as ministers religiously. Uh, and so they were Jews. That meant they believed in Jehovah. We could say today they believe in Jesus. You know, we're Christian, they would have said. But they were exorcists. That means they were those that were going around claiming that they could free people, deliver people from demons. And they took upon them to call over that which had evil spirits in the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, we adjure thee or rebuke you by Jesus, whom Paul preached. And they were the seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew. He was a Jew also, a chief priest, which did so. So here we are. We got seven men. Uh, their sons, their spiritual followers, spiritual sons, not necessarily biological, but spiritual sons of one named Sceva. Sceva most likely was not his name. It, it, Sceva just literally means in Greek, a high priest. A high priest in this uh, religion of magic and sorcery. Uh, they were Jews, so they were Today would have been said we're Christian witches, which we know there's no such thing. But they're, they're, well, we believe in Jesus, but we practice magic. We practice witchcraft. And this is sorcerers. And, and these men were followers. They were students of Sceva. And they said, we've been watching Paul. And, and these people would use any name of any deity, any god. And they were going around merchandising, making money, saying, you know, we can, we can cast the devil out of this person and get in. And, of course, they had no success in doing it except for merchandising the people. and uh, But when they saw Paul successfully in the name of Jesus casting demons out of people and seeing all these miracles happen, they thought, ooh, we'll just take the name Jesus and we'll go make us some money and, and we'll do the same thing. If it worked for Paul, it'll work for us. But the only thing is, they didn't know Jesus like Paul did. Paul had a relationship with Jesus. They didn't. And uh, they were involved in witchcraft and sorcery and all these black arts. And in verses 15, it said, an evil spirit answered or spoke and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? So these seven sons of Sceva, they go into, I call the original haunted house. They go into this house where these people are demon possessed. They're known for being demon possessed. They come in and they say, we're going to tell the demons to come out of you in the name of Jesus, like Paul did these other people, and you'll get free. But it didn't work. You know what the demons did? The demons answered. The evil spirit spoke. If you don't believe demons can speak, just tune in to all your alphabet news groups today. 
modernly, CBS, ABC, NBC, all the alphabet news, fake newsers, amen, and you'll hear demons speak. Oh, when you hear them Washington, D.C. politicians speak and say it's okay to kill babies and, and let's abort all our babies and let, let, let men marry men and women marry women and, 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 and uh, uh, let little kill children, amen, mutilate their bodies because they don't like the gender they are and they're confused, but let's go ahead and let them have uh, surgeries and, and ha let them have sex changes without parental consent. Come on, somebody. Those are demons talking. You ain't listening to just people. Demons talk. And the evil spirits answered in verses 15 of Acts 19. And they said, look, we know Jesus and we know Paul. Why did they know Paul? Because Paul knew Jesus. No is a word for relationship. We know who Jesus is. We know who Paul is. And the reason they know who Paul is because Paul knew Jesus. Hello, they didn't say we know Saul. Saul would have been the old man, the religious man, the Pharisee, but he had been converted. Oh, if you haven't been converted, demons don't know who you are because that's why they said to the seven sons of Sceva in Acts 19, 15, but who are you? Wow. The demons said, who are you? We don't know who you are. I had a woman years ago, literally this happened, I am not lying, in Walmart, an employee, demon possessed, manifest right in front of the manager at Walmart, and God knows everybody witnessing around. And the demons cried out, let us alone, let us alone. And they said, we know who you are. I said, devil, tell me who you are. And the demon said, you're Marvin Booth. We've dealt with you before. That's the same thing that happened with Jesus in Luke 4. I am not making this up, people. My wife was there to witness it, and that was a Walmart manager, and there were several other people, amen, around witness this very happening. And the demon said, you're Marvin Booth. We've dealt with you before. Demons don't know who Marvin Booth is because Marvin Booth, it's because of Jesus. Because Marvin is nothing without Jesus. I can do nothing without Jesus. He said, you can do nothing without me, John 15, verse 5. Jesus said, I cast out demons by the Spirit of God and the kingdom of God's come nigh to you, Matthew 12, 28. Marvin, don't cast demons out. The Jesus through Marvin cast demons out. Hallelujah. And we must remember that. It's not us. It is him. Hallelujah. But you've got to know him. He's, you've got to have a relationship with him. Or you can forget having power and authority over the demons. And I'm telling you, a lot of people are entering into houses just like these seven sons of Sceva. Literally, the original haunted house right here in Acts 19, verses 13 through 16. And, and, and this is why they have no power over evil, because they are being entertained by the evil during the month of October. Yeah. Well, friend, if you, if, you, if you go and attend haunted houses, first of all, there's something wrong with your relationship with this Holy Ghost that I'm preaching to you about. He would grieve in you. You, you wouldn't enjoy that. You'd grieve instead. And if you enjoy it, that's a sign you're not sanctified. And I'll go ahead and tell you, you play around with this kind of evil and this kind of sinful stuff and this stuff that's associated with the demonic, them devils will laugh at you. They, they know you have no authority over them. They know it. I promise you, demons know who you are. Demons know who's hypocrites and they know who's for real with Jesus Christ. You can't deceive the deceived far as the demons that come to deceive. They'll know if you're for real or not or if you just got a make-believe faith. Hallelujah. And so that's what they said. We said, we know Jesus. Yeah. We know Paul. We know those that's got Jesus in them and that live. But we don't know you because we don't see Jesus in you. The demons didn't find Jesus in those seven sons of Sceva. They were just going to use the name of Jesus. Yeah. And thought they was going to cast out the devils. But listen to what it said. It said in verse 16, and the man in whom the evil spirit was, there was one man in that house, leaped on them, overcame them, prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house. Literally, in verse 16 of Acts 19, they fled out of the house naked and wounded. So that's the original haunted house. There was a demon-possessed man in this house. Here comes these seven students of Sceva, Jews, by the way, who believed in Jehovah, had a little religious. Let's get modern with it. Huh? Well, they went to church. They believed in Jesus. After all, we're Christians. Oh, we, But they couldn't cast the demons out. The demons cast them out of the house, run them out of the house. They were naked and wounded. I don't know. They were probably bleeding. I don't know. They was hurt, but it said they were naked. That goes to show you that demons are behind nudity uh, publicly and, and pornographic, you know, content. And anywhere porn is, demons are. Yeah, a lot of people get demon possessed and are taken over and don't understand. They just think they got an addiction. No, they got a devil. Uh, and so uh, Satan's involved in all that. Even the man at Gadarene that had tens of thousands of demons in him named Legion. 
and in Luke chapter 8, he run around naked. Yeah, so all that stuff's associated with demonic activity. But right here, the original haunted house, that's right. They could not cast the devil out because something was wrong in their life. Um, they didn't have a relationship with Jesus. And so, friend, I'm saying all this to say this. This is that. If you have a true, genuine relationship with Jesus Christ, that means the Holy Spirit dwells in you. You will not associate with that that is the appearance of evil, that is unholy, that is this demonic haunting and this flaunting of fear slash fun in the hour we live. You would abstain from it. You would not adhere to it. You would abstain from it because the Holy Spirit in you would not enjoy it. He would grieve. I'm going to go ahead and tell you. Uh, if, if you play around with all this demonic imagery that has been so associated with our culture for so long, and I can remember a time the Pentecostal church had, had nothing to do with it. Now today in this re revised Pentecost, you know, uh, it's amazing. People come shout and holler and hallelujah, amen. But then uh, on Sunday morning, but Saturday night, you know, they was walking through a cornfield somewhere being scared by people dressed up like demons and devils and uh, called it fun. I've even known of Pentecostal churches that took outings on Saturday, you know, prior to October 31st. And they would go to haunted houses, hallelujah, and then be back in the house of God the next morning wanting to preach to us the holy word of God. I don't think I'll be sitting and listening to you if that's what you do because you got error in your life. You can accept evil. And I'll go ahead and tell you, Jesus preached in their synagogues and he cast out devils, Mark 1 39. Jesus was preaching in the synagogue. Let's go ahead and get modern in the church and the church was demon possessed. He was casting devils out of people. Some haunted houses today are nothing more than corpses posing as churches. They compromise in the pulpit. They compromise with sin. They're producing false converts. They preach a, 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 a righteousness without repentance. They preach a message of grace without the law. I'm telling you, it, it, it's all counterfeit. And some houses are demon possessed. Uh, they call themselves churches, but they're corpses. And they present Sunday after Sunday, the spirit of Luke the spook. Revelation 3 calls it lukewarmness in verse 15. And so uh, if, if you play around with darkness, you're not going to have power over darkness. So I'm going to say that again. You cannot play around with darkness and have power over darkness. And uh, there's a whole lot more I could get into on this. I'm not, I'm not going to do it right now. But I do want to encourage you uh, to watch live and look for recordings of uh, but Sunday, October the 30th at 11 a.m. Uh, in our Sunday morning service right here at Acts 29 Church in the God at 2913 Albany Avenue in Waycross, Georgia, we will be presenting in depth uh, divine discernment historically, but most importantly, biblically on what God's word says concerning what we call Halloween. And uh, is it hallowed or is it harmful? The history of the name where it came from, and it was derived. The name Halloween is a Christian name. In the year 900, uh, the Catholic Church, you know, said that uh, as an alternative uh, to what the Celts were doing, who were, you know, demon worshipers uh, and, and Satan worshipers, uh, their festival, their feast they were having, uh, they said, let's combat it and let's have an alternative. And, and so they said the eve before, let's have ours in, in the honor of, dead saints that have passed and they called it All Hallows Eve, which has grew to become the popular word rather Halloween. And then All Saints Day would be November the first. Um uh, and so that's where all that's that stuff originated coming. We'll get more in depth with that. But it's amazing to me. The lukewarm compromising church in the year of nine hundred said let's do an alternative to the demonic practices of the Celts and what's going on where all these customs, you know, of even modern Halloween, all the way to trick or treat and all the other stuff associated with it actually has its roots derived from. Uh, ain't it amazing that the lukewarm church then says, you know, let's not say nothing against it, but let's just have an alternative alongside of it. Look what it's gave us. Yeah. And churches and the lukewarm are still doing the same thing today. 
They're not speaking out against it. And they're not declaring the truth. And all they're doing is having their little, little festivals and everything else alongside of it in silence, in silence. And remember, God said in Ephesians 5, 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Unfruitful. All over winning people to Jesus. Demons don't win people to Jesus. Devils don't win people to Jesus. Compromise don't win people to Jesus. All you're doing is producing false converts. <laughs> well, we're doing something like an alternative thing. <laughs> that ain't winning nobody. Uh -uh. Demons don't win people to Jesus. The truth of the Spirit of God does. That's what converts sinners and saints. And, and, and so all the way back to where the deriving of the name Halloween even came from, it came from a Christian definition perspective, All Hallows' Eve, which became Halloween. And, you know, so let's not say nothing against it, but let's do an alternative alongside of it. And in doing so, compromise has brought us to where we are today in the modern church. And instead of having no fellowship with it at all, no association, even in alternatives, nothing, yeah, having no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness. He said, rather reprove them, Ephesians 5, 11. So if we're not reproving them, we're approving them. And we're fellowshipping with it, the evil, the unfruitful works of darkness, uh, if we're actually remaining silent. If all we're doing is having a little alternative thing alongside of it, and we're not speaking out against it. Um, that's a compromise. That's a fellowship. Yeah, it is. Hallelujah. So I hope you've enjoyed it today. Uh, you may have heard some things, may have irritated you, made you a little mad, uh, but that's okay too. Hallelujah. Jesus loves you. And uh, his word, let me, let me just tell you in closing what his word to do. He said, thy word is truth. Sanctify them with thy truth. Thy word is truth, John 17, 17. So the whole purpose of what God's word is supposed to do, like a sword, Hebrews 4, 12, is to come and sanctify us to separate us from that that would separate us from him, that that's not of him. So, uh, friend, if the truth you're hearing preached to you every week is not separating you, if it's not piercing and puncturing you and, and, and spiritually doing surgery and saying, let's divide this, let's, you got to get, get this off, get that, well, then you're not sitting up under the spirit of truth because when the spirit of truth has come, Jesus said, in John 16, verses 8, he said he's going to reprove the world of sin. When this Holy Ghost, who is holy, when he, the Spirit of truth, comes to preach this truth, first thing he's going to deal with always is sin. So these soothsayers posing as, you know, pulpit preachers in our time who preach to you salvation but never bring up the subject of sin, who invite you to heaven but never warn you about hell, they are Christianize witches, they're soothsayers, they're warlocks. And, and the false prophet, that's what the soothsayer is, uh, the false prophet today is not known, you know, for not speaking some of the truth. The false prophets are known because they don't tell you all the truth. They just tell you sided truth, selectively. They're specialists. God has never called anybody to be a specialist in the ministry. Well, I only encourage the church. God don't tell me to preach. No, if you're a real preacher, you'll preach the whole Bible. You'll preach in season and out of season. You'll reprove, you'll rebuke, rebuke with all long suffering and doctrine. Second Timothy 4, verses 2. Why? Because the time will come. They're not going to endure sound doctrine. Why can't they endure it? Because all they want is a word they can enjoy. This ain't about just enjoying a message. This is about being able to endure because and sit there and know that God's getting on to you, that God's showing you this ain't right. And not getting mad and offended and going looking for another soothsayer, another preacher, another church, but repent and say, Lord, forgive me. I was wrong. Hallelujah. But people are heaping to themselves. That means God ain't calling those people to them to preach to them. They're calling the people they want to hear, the selective hearing, the itchy ear, the itchy ear, saying, I don't want to hear that. I want to hear what I want to hear that, that joy makes me feel good. And uh, he said, they're heaping to themselves teachers having itchy ears and they turn from the truth. Listen to what they do. Verses four, second Timothy four. They turn from the truth and they turn to fables. And some of this stuff we've been speaking about, people excuse the evil, even though it's flaunted in fear, associated with fun, you know, before them, obvious that it's evil. But they always say, well, it's only make-believe. That's the same as saying it's only fantasy. Yeah. Oh, there's no harm in it. God says that kind of fantasy will turn your ear away from hearing the truth. And that's, and that's what's happening. People, people turn their ear away 
of hearing the truth because they would rather defend the fantasy than the faith. Hallelujah. Well, you better stick with the faith. Because I'm telling you, all this stuff that even people call fantasy and just fun and make believe and uh, just fun with fear in the month of October, I'm telling you, these haunted houses and all this stuff associated with Halloween, it's all rooted in demonic possession. And in Acts 19, we prove to you there is original haunted house. And in that house, the reason it was haunted is because the demon possessed were in there. Demon spirits was in there. Amen. And those seven sons of Sceva could not cast those devils out. And those seven sons of Sceva, they were Jews. They all had a level of so-called faith in God, faith in Jehovah. Oh, we believe in God. We believe in Jesus. But we go and play around with the occult and with the darkness and with the evil. Friend, you can't have both. He said, I'll have you not to fellowship with devils. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 20. So reprove it. If you don't, you approve of it. And speaking of approval, I'd like to say, I approve of this message, says the Lord. Yeah, he approves. Praise God. That's all that matters. God, to you be the glory. And God, I pray for people today that, Lord God, they'd repent of any association, any attraction uh, to this evil and this darkness associated with Halloween and, and haunted houses and, and all these different types of things. Lord, that they'd hear the truth and they'd open their heart and follow you, Holy Spirit, because when you come, you'll guide us into all the truth. Holy Ghost is one thing I know about you. You will never lead us into error. You'll never lead us into compromise with evil. You'll always lead us out. And that's what you're doing now. You're saying, come out from among the world. You're not telling us to get along with the world. No, you're saying, come out from among it and be separate. And I'll be a father to you. And you'll be my sons and daughters. In Jesus' name. And the church said, amen. Share this video. Don't forget Sunday, October the 30th at 11 a.m. We'll be preaching on this. And I failed to mention October the 30th at 6 p.m. that night, we'll be having a service here at Acts 29, Church of the God, 2913 Albany Avenue in Way Across, Georgia. And that night, after we preach and minister, we're going to have special guests here from the Willacoochee Church of God, their praise team. Pastor Clint and his congregation is going to be here with us and help us in the worship. And when we get through preaching that night, we're going to have a barrel or two set up outside. And people's going to take, according to Acts 19, it's written right here in Acts 19, they did this. Uh, these in the same chapter, they took all the things that they, you know, the occult, the witchcraft, in verses 19, and they burn them in the fire. It says it's about 50,000 pieces of silver is what it, all these books of witchcraft and the occult uh, would have been worth. To date, that it amounted to about $5.5 million. They burn it with fire. That's what we're going to do on Sunday night, October the 30th. Uh, service begins at 6 p.m. Somewhere after that service, we're going to burn anything that's associated with the cult, with witchcraft, Satanism, paganism, anything ungodly, unholy. Because that's what he did in the Bible. They didn't have rummage sales and garage sales and resell it to somebody else. No, they threw it in the fire. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to throw witchcraft. We're going to throw all this stuff in the fire and watch it burn and give God praise. I remember seeing people do this years ago in revivals we had, and they'd get filled with the Holy Ghost right in that moment, speaking with other tongues. Hallelujah. I know it's a little old school. Hallelujah. Amen. But uh, Paul in Acts 19 separated disciples, and they was at the school of Tyrannus. Amen. For a couple of years as he taught them the kingdom of God. It may be old school, but it's the kingdom of God. And uh, we give God praise. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Now we're going to try to get through here, and I can't figure out how I always do this, but here we go, finish.